мы решили разбить наш разговор на такие фрагменты, которые позволят и Хусаму рассказать про его проект, и мне по очереди. И мы решили разделить наш ток на несколько частей. Первая часть – это про один проект из алюминия, с применением алюминия, а второй проект с применением стекла. Также мы немножко расскажем коротко совсем о компаниях, в которых мы работаем. И начнет разговор Хусам. Сколько у нас есть времени всего? 50 минут? We have 50 minutes. Okay. 50 total. Yeah. Five zero. Okay. Yeah. And you can you can start with uh, uh, telling about your office. And, yeah. yeah. Um, thanks very much for having me here. Um, my name is Hussam Chakouf. I joined Zaha Hadid office around 15 years ago. Um, as you know, I mean, I were involved in a couple of projects. Um, some of them already built. Um, can we probably? Go to the next slide, or are you controlling yeah, that? Yeah. Um, as you know, we are um, one of the most innovative companies in the world. Um, we're technically building and designing um, uh, pretty much in 50 countries. Um, as you can see, like this is a different um, kind of typology buildings. Um, all what you can see in the screen is built already. Probably if I can go to the um, yeah, I mean this is the um, the other the other uh, project in a way we were um, some of them uh, under design development and some of them uh, like different typology as you can see. Um, like single buildings or maybe master plan, um, different scale buildings. Um, you can see in the corner, this is the spare bank um, for Russia, which is under construction now. Yeah. Ну, зовут Борис Бернаскони, я тоже так получился архитектор. И 20 лет назад вступил в эту замечательную стихию. За 20 лет мы сделали очень много разных проектов, и маленьких, и больших, но не такое, конечно, большое количество, как у Захи Хадид. И мы в основном работаем, конечно, с прямоугольными формами в отличие от Захи, и мы об этом тоже поговорим чуть позже. Uh, I think you can start with the next picture. Yeah. Может быть, вы будете листать. Это вот наши проекты, но не все. Давайте дальше. Um, I want to speak about my experience in aluminium or let's say at the moment, um, experience. Uh, this is Dominion Project in, in Moscow. Um, at the time, I involved in the facade um, design of this building during the construction period. Um, I remember when we started designing uh, the Arup, it was um, the uh, facade consultants. So what happened, um, we start with uh, with the dimensions like 60 by 60. This is now way the limited of the sheet, I think it's like 10 years ago or something. Um, however, we, we tried to push the boundary of the material, how we can achieve more, because somehow we would like to emphasize the horizontality of the building. Um, the issue, we manage at the end that to develop the details to push the sheet to 3.7 meter by 1.6. But that also required to change the details, that you have to have a frame around it, and then add the stiffeners. And then the difficulty would be like how you wanna also wrap it up around the edge. Like, especially when you see, uh, when you see like from the window, how you can all see this plate without any joints. However, I mean, at the end of the day, we, we I think probably the client went local. And then as you can see the result, it's still, it's still like we achieved a very elegant, nice design. But at that time, we're trying to push um, the, the industry more. I believe it's already like developed. Um, it was the first the building, as I remember, by yeah. Zach Hadid in Moscow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the first one. Yeah. It was many approaches before, right? Yeah. But this is the first, the first one. It was um, a very, very nice experience, actually, in um, to do all that. I mean, I worked with it uh, with the Krustos Passes. He was the project director, and then he designed it, but I was involved in the facade only. 
That's an interesting material. Yeah, you can see also here the corner, all the details, like everything aligned together, doing this double curvature piece. It was a bit of a challenge, but then it worked well in the end. Можно листать еще дальше. I will be your clicker. А можно еще покликать? Вот. Yeah, this is how it looks like overall. And there is one more from the interior, I guess. А насколько большие консоли? How big are consoles here? The the size of the. I can't actually remember, but probably I think one of the dimensions um, sixty. Uh, I believe the other maybe 100, 120. But you see, it's it's very because the more what you were aligning, we're aligning the joint together with the glass. And then you see like at the corner, it's really very where we can, you want to have all the the corner really like neat and sharp. So we do two joints around it and then the rest of the joints will follow um, the the glass, the glass panels. I wasn't that sure. Yeah, this is how the interior where you can see how the flooring and the, um, the stairs, they are inter integrated uh, with each other. We, we designed the public spaces in this building, but not um, the interior space of the offices. Aluminium was used on the facades, right? Yeah, on the mm -hmm. facade as cladding material. Mm -hmm. okay. This is more like steel. Можно дальше. А я расскажу про Matrix. Это, собственно, здание, оно построено в Сколково. Его здесь недалеко. Я показывал сегодня Хусаму yeah. из окна вот этого сооружения. Можно дальше. Это матрешка внутри пирамиды. Ну, мы публиковали уже довольно много информации про этот дом, и он выступал на Биеннале. Можно дальше. И мы использовали здесь, в этом здании, дальше фасад, алюминий в фасаде. То есть это довольно... Сложный, сложный, сложный был фасад, он по сути представляет собой кровлю, и поэтому у него особые условия по гидроизоляции. Модульные стеклопакеты, модульные элементы алюминиевого фасада, самого можно дальше... Можно дальше. И а, алюминий здесь используется как в несущих а, рамах пакетов, можно дальше, так и в, собственно, в элементах фасада самого. И мы подумали, что вообще единственный материал для такого фасада наклонного – это алюминий. Иногда, а, алюминий. иногда в наклонных фасадах используют камень, но, на мой взгляд, Камень не соответствует вообще тектонике ломанных поверхностей, потому что, ну, как вообще любой вент-фасад, на мой взгляд, потому что это, в общем, такой обман, по большому счету. Камень должен использоваться либо в кладке, ну, либо как-то особо обработанным. И для таких конструкций, как ломанный фасад со сложной геометрией, как раз алюминий с его качествами подходит, на мой взгляд, лучше всего. Можно полистать. В общем, я долго комментировать не буду. Ну, конечно, в интерьере там много очень всего было сделано из алюминия, но это не системный материал с точки зрения конструкции. Он используется в основном только для фасада. Про интерьер я ничего рассказывать не буду. Дальше передаю слово про следующее здание из стекла Хусамо. Before that, actually, I want to ask you, what is the dimension of the probably slab to slab, or what's the dimension of the glass panels on your building? Ah, uh, you can list which one? Like the dimension here you are using, probably the size yeah. or. The size. Uh, there are different sizes actually because uh, it goes from bigger than uh, to thinner parts, yeah. uh, from downstairs to upstairs. Uh, around ones. around three meters high and different width. Okay. Yeah. Because also more you are focusing on the shape 
as well. You start you start from this one. I believe. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we uh, uh, try to cancel this uh, monolith uh, angle parts of the building. Yeah. And try to cancel this uh, with the glass. Yeah, it's very interesting building. Um, the other experience I want to talk about is um, the project is called OPPO for a headquarter of uh, OPPO company in Shenzhen. Um, this is a competition we won, um, I remember it's probably November 2019, a couple of months before the pandemic. Um, as you can see, the, the shape, it's really from uh, four ellipsoid connecting together, um, trying to create more uh, like um, a glass bubble in a way. Um, the challenge in this project, technically, how we are going to penalize the glass that you still, it is buildable, affordable, at the same time will will give you all of these, uh, let's say, smooth surface look um, where where you will have double curvature geometry and all of these spaces also um, how you want to do around um, this um, uh, shape in a way. Um, um, as you can see, probably if I go back one image, that we divided, we didn't really go radial on dividing the panelization, more we, we sliced the building in this way that we can create vertical ellipsoil, which is going to be, at the end, use the lighting design, how to... Um, uh, like present this uh, building during night. Um, um, the issue, you can also see the complexity of that shape, how we continue, how we are going to wrap up the, um, uh, the mullions, the frame of the window around this corner, which is already meant from double curvature. Um, now we finished the DD stage of this project, and then all the glass panels has been worked out um, to reach the regulation where maximum you can have eight square meter. And when you are in the subtle area, more like 15, um, let's say, degree inclined, they will consider it as a skylight. So the size is limited to four square meter. So all of that has been uh, applied already. And then you can see, um, given the fact it's like four and a half meter distance, you don't feel that uh, the huge uh, size of, uh, of the mullions in, in a way. And um, so it's a glass and aluminium facade and more um, you have double curvature, um, cold bended and maybe some uh, flat uh, panels. And then of course the aluminium would follow the shape of, of the glass. Some of them also acting um, with the same offices. We actually started to talk about steel, not just like that, because we обсуждали проблему вообще современности в архитектуре и поняли, что вот кроме алюминия, есть еще алюминия, такой серьезный конкурент, это стекло. So we discussed that glass is a concurrent of aluminium technology, is a contemporary of architecture. И просто в качестве примера я тоже показываю наш конкурсный проект в Перми, который был сделан в 2008 году. И, кстати, Заха Хадид тогда тоже участвовал в этом конкурсе, бюро Заха Хадид, с, конечно же, традиционной такой сложной геометрией. И, в общем, все, конечно, в тот момент, в 2008 году, удивлялись, как это вообще возможно построить в Перми, тем более объект сложной геометрии. Но сегодня уже очевидно, что можно строить любой геометрии объекты и технологии, в общем, постепенно догоняют идеи архитекторов. Но мы все равно традиционно работаем с прямоугольными формами. Мы не гонимся за сложной геометрией, исходя из... Ну, просто у нас немножко другой подход, наверное, исходя из такой рациональности, что ли, рационального подхода, может быть, мы как-то продолжаем идеи рационалистов и конструктивистов начала 20 века. Может быть, потому что, в общем, не видим смысла в сложной геометрической форме. Но тогда мы выиграли, и этот объект представлял собой тоже простой монолит, врезанный в 
берег Перми, представляешь собой полностью конструктив из бетона и стеклянную, стеклянную оболочку. В конце беседы, наверное, мы хотели поговорить, как раз позадавая друг другу вопросы о качестве, что мы считаем вообще качественным сегодня в истории, какие качества мы видим и как мы эти качества прорабатываем в наших работах. So my question will be for you. Hussam, what do you think about uh, the idea of quality in architecture today and what type of quality you are uh, thinking on when you are designing contemporary building? Um, I think for us, um, of course, the form of the building, it's uh, important. It comes probably the priority, but also how to design the good space or the quality of the space inside also quite an important. Um, I want to just say like how we um, create the idea of OPPO building because technically when we start any any high-rise building, you will you will go for the traditional way of doing it. You put the core in the middle and then more of the offices will be surrounding it. Since the, the volume is really like large, around 185,000 square meter, and then probably the more useful to have two towers rather than three. But then what do you manage at the end? That to push the core in red, we push them outside, and then create the office spaces to be in this position. I mean, of course, the position of them will have like a better view to the Shenzhen Bay, in, in the south from this area. And that allow when we connect, um, uh, let's say the two soil together or the four soil together, we managed to have around 5,000 square meter open plan um, working space. Um, and that for us, as you can see here, this is the final product um, where, where you have all of these big uh platform where the people they can work together they can see each other they interact during the day and um, one more one more issue we add that how we can of course you are connecting vertically through the course but how you are going to enhance the um, the horizontal uh, connectivity in the building so one of the ideas we propose to have a sky lobby in level 11 and 12 in, in that space and then also create the atrium around like 20 floors where also they, the employee, they can really um, interact like the couple, three, four floors, they will be also connected. In the back here, you have a small atrium which connect the every three floors together. So like moving between the floors, it's not really an issue. And then also you encourage people probably to work a um, couple of minutes, you go, you can have a coffee, you could have a chat, you create all of these somehow public spaces for the employee uh, to see it. And this is where the first proposal for how level 11 and 12 has been implemented, where you can have different activities like a gym, sport, food, um, lounge, you can meet your friend. Also, there is a conference on it. It's like um, like this is the hub of the building where it's going to be in everyone uh, visiting or working on the building uh, to do it. So somehow this is how we, we develop the, um, the space planning for, uh, for the building. Um, moving into more details, like how, how we are going to create or make sure like arranging the working space in that environment. It also like continue with the best quality you can have. So, um, using some some tools that you can see, um, uh, like different layout, different furniture, where you can create sort of a group of people, cluster of people that work together, they meet together, they do more collaborative work during the day. And um, um, this is the traditional way to furnish it, and this is more more innovative, more dynamic. It also, you know, with the technology, this building, it, it should last probably for a hundred years. And then you see the technology, it's really evolving a lot. So you never know what is the demand of the team working in the future. And that really provides uh, more, uh, let's say, flexibility 
and then how how the organization of the building it might really grow in the future. And uh, if you look at the numbers, we are not really far off from achieving the traditional way, but then also this is like 8.6 um, density per square meter rather than this is 7, 7.5. So the quality of the space and it's more it's more dynamic and more enjoyable um, in this building. Um, I mean, of course, um, if you ask why why it's taking that shape, we took all of these analysis. What is the natural movement to move between the core and the fire um, exits with the different cores? What is the natural movement around? And then and then we put the furniture um, in more like the dark green space. Also, what is the visibility quality? Uh, of of the employee where they are working together, how they can interact, then maybe uh, communicate together, and um, like one more one more aspect of um, the issue we look at also the if I go back um, the um, uh, the light penetration. So technically, when you are in this zone, you will have more light. When you move on, you will have less, and then. There is some zones you will have uh, a darker area, and this is really switch off to be uh, more like uh, printing, meeting rooms, all so on for for the team. So this is in terms of the quality how you design and generate the space in a way which is very important um, because some people believe that the square it's more effective or more efficient space, but Zaha said once in a way that if we believe in this fact, then or the nature, it's really a waste of space. So this is one of the aspects we follow it. Um, Excuse me, do, do we believe that we need offices today? After, well, after COVID-19, for example? Well, look, I think what happened with us, I mean, I worked probably one year and a half in this project. Unfortunately, we, we signed the contract before Christmas and then we, we, we did the ceremony in December. And after that, we stop going to the client meeting, and then we start. We start with uh, with the pandemic, so we we move to Zoom and all of these software. Um, it worked well with us because we already we know each other. We know how we work. That's fine. So we are sustaining the way we are working. The issue: how when you will have a new, let's say, staff or architects, designers joining you. Um, they are skilled, of course, but they don't know the social aspects of the team, the teamwork. Of course, you will do to a meeting, you will give them a chance to design. That's fine, but you will miss the aspects to have like random conversation with your colleague to learn something or maybe just overhearing some conversation. Probably it has nothing to do with you but it will inform you something about the environment. So what you will do now, it's more we'll do hybrid system. So we can come to the office. We have space still. And you will come probably, it depends on the team need. You will come once, twice a week. You do team meeting, you negotiate, you discuss, and then you continue. I mean, we don't know in future what will happen, to be honest. But it's proven that still you can do better performance when you are when you are working uh, from that space. But I'm not sure, what, what, what's your experience in that? Uh, it's a question of so socialization, actually, office yeah. today. So I'm not sure uh, we will need it in the future uh, because software is developing so well and so fast uh, that you can use VR technologies, for example, to socialize same as you will be in the office, for example. So it's a question of software and it's a question of time. Maybe we, of course, the population of Earth is growing fast. So now we are 8 billion and in uh, next 100 years, we will be around 12 billion. So that means that we will need space. But I'm not sure that the quality of this space uh, is uh, will have some uh, aesthetics aspects. So I'm not sure that aesthetics will be on the table in uh, like 50 years. Mm. Maybe there will be not already aesthetics. Uh, there will be only function, for example, yeah. because all the aesthetics will be in VR uh, content. Yeah. 
that means that it doesn't matter which shape you will have. Uh, the matters uh, will be ma will matters. For example, the um, uh, principle of construction, yeah, of square meters. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm always thinking, and my question is, uh, uh, wh what architecture is uh, for? What, what architecture is doing? Is it for about form or about? Uh, vi visual quality of the space, uh, or it's about the um, способ, как будет способ по-английски, uh, approach, approach of uh, approach of uh, creating spaces. Yeah. So for me, uh, th this is more interesting question. Yeah. Uh, not the form or uh, aesthetics. That's why actually. Um, Maybe our project in Perm won, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, because it's, it was more mm, uh, functional way of uh, establishing uh, building in this area with more simple technologies, with low tech, not with the high tech. Yeah. So I'm not sure that high tech will won will win the this. Uh, uh, um, uh, battle yeah this situation so it's always uh, it's always a battle between uh, complex form between uh, high tech and uh, simple low tech form and low tech approaches to create spaces yeah well i think i think what's important is um it's still the space the quality of the space you live in it's important rather if physically you are going to meet the others or virtually this is like subject to technology and let's say what whatever probably your career but that probably raised the question how we are going to develop the cities these days to be more sustainable i remember um when i did a master in um housing and urbanism in a way the thesis was how to make the city how the mixed use make the city more sustainable so in a way how you can create a neighborhood where you can work and live and entertain and meet people probably within a walking distance that will help while reducing the number of the cars and the pollution and everything. But when COVID happened, it's really now raised another question, how we are going to create a co-working spaces where, of course, you are at home, but at some point you need really to focus. I mean, it depends what you are doing, of course, but you need to have your own space to produce more efficiently in certain amount of time when you do it. And then you might also... You are in the space, but you have a screen. It's open all the time. I mean, you are in virtual space with all of your colleagues, your team, and you can hear the background of the others. So like creating, let's say, somewhere on the space, on the cloud, that this is our space, but all of us connecting to it, all of us are inter interacting, working, and, and continue that could be one of possibility. But... I think now everyone, like when you look at the house, for instance, people used to live next to the office because for the walking distance to really save time and commuting. When you don't have to go to the office, everyone like went far away from the city for the countryside to have a bigger space where with the same amount of, of cost, technically. So this is the issue we want to think about. And then what you are going to do with all the office spaces already existing in the city, this is another another question need to be answered or at least we should do some movement to it yeah but i'm, I'm talking that uh, about for example a situation when uh, somebody is more efficient in for example post-industrial space so there are many examples when uh, uh, young people are working in uh, uh, not new created spaces but in the post-industrial uh, reused spaces. So, and uh, it doesn't matter actually. Uh, are you in the just new builded space, or you are using old concrete uh, exactly. yeah. room? Well, it depends on your need, right? If you, I mean, it's became now a preference that whatever, whatever you want, this is your own space. You create it the way you want it, and then you will have the technology to connect you with whoever you want to work with. 
I mean, whatever you are. We have like examples where our colleagues, they go to around the world and then they work from any country they want because it happens. I mean, probably the time zone is a little bit problematic, but somehow if you have um, enough connectivity with internet, you can work anywhere from anywhere on the planet. And what do you think about quality of uh, construction? I mean, uh, in Russia, in uh, Great Britain, yeah. in... Uh, well, I think it's achievable, definitely. But China. you can't really achieve any quality um, you are aiming for. Um, like somehow it became, it's become complicated when you are working not standard size probably or not standard form. You need really a bit of more um, like effort to analyze the building. So if you look at the screen behind you, this is like for OPPO. Um, we spent probably more than eight months analyzing like rebuilding the form and then um, think about how we are going to do the panelization of uh, the glass panels. The issue, you have to be careful how different panels they will be really connecting together with really like tiny angles. You don't want, you don't want the facade to be, um, uh, let's say, faceted. It's you have to have all of the smooth the smooth look of it. And then all of these analysis with all of these, in a way, as you can see, there is um, complex geometry on all of these sizes. We managed at the end to do it, but then also, um, well, thanks for the technology we have, probably all the technique um, we're using, like Grasshopper here, for instance, really to, to, to get all of this information. Um, I would say um, the manufacturer, they are really willing to do it. But somehow, more the designers and the architect, they need to provide the product. Is it the influence of the software, or uh, definitely it's became easier with the software? I mean, imagine you want to do that in 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 hand and draw it. Probably it's impossible. But when we when you use a format, some some like software like Grasshopper, you can you can already create it, and then you can differentiate each color. It's really represent the type of glass, and then as I said previously you have restriction in um, panel size from regulation, from uh, oven size, coating size, the ability of the manufacturer. But it's all of you knew it before you start. And then you start apply all of these criteria into the building. And then at the end, you will achieve it. Uh, what I can tell you from this example, we're already we're ready to tender the, uh, the the facade package like soon. So all all of those in a way like different colors, it's really passed. It get approved in a way by the government and by all the local architect that this is buildable within regulations, and we're already in contact with manufacturers. So it will happen. And oh. then some some of these panels also double curvature. I mean, not all of them. I mean, we start the project; it was thirty five percent double curvature, and then now we are under five percent. And that, I mean, the quality you will achieve it for sure, regardless how you are going to use it. But rather than you do facet it for the double curvature, it's like one piece. Of course, more expensive. Red is double um, no, actually, this one red probably it's double curvature yeah, panels yeah. exactly like you can see here. So it's really limited. Yeah, it's limited. Yeah, and then also like the size of it because you know. It has different different way of calculating. And what do you think about quality of construction in different countries? I mean, uh, China and Russia. It's different. Well, um, now I mean is, for 2020. Yeah, I think you always like you can see in both countries very interesting, uh, let's say, product and buildings. Definitely, it's way way more better than what it used to be. It's always like coming coming along. But I think it's need really collaboration between the architect and the manufacturer together. I think probably also the way we we produce the information, it has to be adjusted a little bit rather than you you continue just producing the construction document by yourself as designer. It's more we should encourage the client to to communicate with the manufacturer earlier on this stage, even like one or two, I mean still the competition is there, but at least to work together where you can create different details to achieve what you want to achieve. But I, I, I feel like it's really achievable. And then it's not about um, maybe how how expensive it is. It's it's more like the way we are going to do it in collaborative manner with different participants in the project. Definitely will achieve it. 
what's what's not, your not experience? always not always <laughs> yeah so uh my question is for example is it possible to build uh, with the same quality in azerbaijan with the same quality as for example in uh, uh america i don't think so well it is it's still different right yeah but our experience always we want to build at the time we are we used to have always like international uh contractor in mm. a way like the, in terms of procedure and behavior mm. and the tendering process whatever anyone do anywhere in the world um but recently i mean i mean china also they have really international cons- um the same construction companies but they are at the same time also they are big and local and they use um all the materials made in china and then this is one example like for now they are trying to build everything uh, from china so it's more but if if you think about it we start building in china 2008 and this is our we already have three building four buildings completed including the airport three big mix use project one of them tower and then now we finish the airport and then this is other i mean plus we have previous project which is guangzhou opera house um but all of that it's done and Chinese contractor, Chinese materials. And then you can see while you are dealing with the complex geometry, you will have experience. So somehow when you do things, you will learn more rather than you watching it, how it's going to happen. So we, we need to jump into the challenge. We need to do it. And this is how we're going to, how we're going to evolve. So you see like in, in any countries, if, if, if the contractors and the client willing really to explore all of this possibility, definitely they will achieve it. I'm not sure what's your experience in your buildings. Uh, so I don't have so many buildings as you, as the Hadid office, but I can tell you that uh, the quality of the building, of course, depends on um, culture you are creating to build it. So because you are absolutely right that you need to c- collaborate. And the, uh, the problem is of collaborating that you are spending time so you are spending resources, uh, time, money, uh, specialists, uh, mostly time and money. Yeah. And that means that uh, the, the price of the objects, uh, starting to grow, which sometimes is not very good for, for, uh, for example, simple thing when you are trying to create social housing in Siberia. It's, uh, uh, you, you don't have much resources even for construction and you have to understand how you have to approach this region, this culture of uh, construction, uh, communicating and so on. That means that, uh, yeah, you can't create a uh, high tech building, for example, as, as yours. And in, in this way, uh, I think, uh, for, for me, of course, for me, the way of uh, designing, the way of building, the way of um, creating um, an object uh, is uh, more important than the other things, yeah, yeah. like uh, form or uh, even form doesn't matter in this case. So uh, I'm designing the the way of creating the object here and now so and this is also it's like programming maybe so it's more from it uh industry it's more from you know gaming or uh, uh, researching uh, so it's a little bit different uh, maybe even sometimes not visual uh, approach so when uh, form doesn't matter but when we started uh, with uh, with the design, we, of course, we started with the uh, multidisciplinary approach. So we are, of course, we are, first of all, we are designing you know, from the small things to big things. So we are designing from the function uh, outside, not from outside inside. So this is this is a little bit another approach because. Uh, I think many people are uh, uh, looking and understanding architecture, looking at architecture, understanding architecture as a visual uh, 
parts of the culture. But uh, this is only one small thing of iceberg. Yeah, yeah. you know that. Yeah, of so the the biggest part is under the water. So and I think this is a very interesting part uh, in architecture to to go from the uh, function to the form. So and that means that somehow and uh, sometimes uh, uh, form can be changed. The, because this is my biggest question to Zach Hadid architects, you know, yeah. why you are always doing this, uh, <laughs> uh, these forms? Why? Right. So what, 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 what is the concept? What is the message? So to to achieve uh, to achieve uh, high tech approach, or uh, what is, what is the idea? Um, no, the issue that you wanna you wanna create something let's say innovative, different. In each building, when you try um, to design, we push the boundaries. Like with this OPPO building, you can see that definitely we want to achieve like a glass bubble at the end. I mean, it comes with the challenge, of course, right? Um, but just to go one step back to answer the, is the function follow the form or the form follow the function? It is a conversation actually, but let's say, somehow we develop our idea that we are going to create that form, right? But then you are going to test it. How it's going to work functionally. How you are going to also have nice environment for the people, for the users, the end users of the building. It's the most important thing. I agree with you. And um, if you also noticed, when we present our building, we always care how it looks from the eye level like how you are going to receive the building, how you are going to receive the space. Is it comfortable? Is not? It's a big question for us, right? It's always important. Um, but then, like creating different or, let's say, extraordinary form, this is like our special speciality. In a way, this is what you want to do. This is how we are going to uh, promote ourselves. It's more like also you want to look uh, pure form in a way that if you look at OPPO, some of the building, it's more like organic shape. Some of references, we go to the nature. I mean, if you look at the um, pineapple, for instance, or the giraffe skin, it's all like parametrically designed, right? It's all one element. It's really allocated in a certain way to follow the form while it's really like wide or when it became narrow. It's more like a natural thing. The parametric come from, or we could relate it in one argument, could be related to nature, and we are trying to bring that. Also, I know it's easier to build straight building, extrusion, definitely, but what you want to also achieve, that probably nothing impossible in, in, in industry and construction. You know, you could really achieve achieve a lot, but I agree with you, the function, it's important. And also the space, the quality of the space, also very important. And the environment issue, making also probably use sustainable material. This is like one of our discussions yesterday and dinner, like how we can um, promote the materials also to be more more sustainable. And then, you know, the questions now of 3D printing, how you can do it using using the, the soil with some cement or different material. It's all probably this is the answer of how the future building is going to look like. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Big discussion. Yeah, I know. This okay, guys. Beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Boris, I have a simple question to you. In terms of sustainability in a building and uh, the norms in Russia, uh, if we compare the West, uh, the buildings are much more inclined towards getting some kind of a LEED certifications. And if we have to imply the same in Russia, especially Moscow, how does this sustainability with regard to the materials that are being used in a building with respect to the LEED certifications work. Is there something similar standard or it's just uh, something um, more closer to it? So I hope uh, if you can answer on that, please. 
Uh, I didn't get the, the question. Actually. The question what is very the simple. Question? In terms of sustainability yeah. of uh, materials, let's say you want to build a building, not yeah. for five years, ten years, but for a long time. Mm -hmm. And generally in the West, it's certified using the LEED, L-E-E-D, which is Green Building Solutions. Uh, is there something similar or is also LEED as a standard used in Russia? Uh, there are many standards actually uh, used in Russia. For example, this building, Matrix, which is located here, we designed uh, using Briam uh, standards. And another building we built here also, Hypercube, this was the first building in Skolko, we designed with the LEED certification, actually with the author of this uh, certification. And after this uh, collaboration, I know him very well. He's a very nice guy, but I understood that the LEED certification uh, leads only for maybe industrial buildings. So you can't use this uh, uh, approach uh, for creating uh, De, uh, like for creating very special public buildings, for example. You can use it only for non-public, even maybe non-official building, because it's too complicated to achieve all the points from leads if you are uh, using modern technologies, for example, only glass. You can't, you can't get uh, leads, for example, with this glass building in Shenzhen. It's impossible because you will lose all the points because of glass facade. Uh, so I think that uh, this certification uh, is uh, somewhere there. So architecture is always uh, in avant-garde. So when certification goes uh, behind. So I don't believe in all these certification situations. Uh, maybe it helps, of course, to uh, achieve some points uh, for collaboration for uh, the team who is working on this building. Because uh, uh, in this case, uh, at least uh, all the team will use same rules to uh, achieve uh, uh, the common result, yeah. So, but uh, if the the team is uh, uh, intellectual and uh, quite well uh, organized, uh, this team d d don't need any certification. So in Russia, it doesn't work because uh, this kind of architecture is uh, expensive, and uh, I think uh, Russia is quite big, but uh, I think the culture uh, of Russia today is not ready for uh, thinking uh, of um, uh, great perspective. So uh, we are living like, you know, one day uh, butterfly. I mean, if we will talk about architecture. So we don't think uh, in 100 years. As for example, was with Peter the first when he built Saint Petersburg. So his idea was to, uh, before him in uh, like two, two hundred, three hundred years. So when he established uh, the new new city, actually it was a great immigration because of that because it was a great idea of creating some new. Uh, system or a new city i mean you it's not it was not about city it was uh, about new uh, culture so he took uh, european ideas and created a uh, high tech city uh, in the middle of uh, you know nowhere yeah so this was the idea so in this case when uh, when the team who is creating architecture uh in this case, you, of course, need uh, some kind of rules and certification. And uh, there are many already. So we don't have, we don't, we didn't, we, in Russia, we don't need it. We have BREAM, we have LEED, we have European different standards. So there are many of them and we can use them. Uh, we have green standard here, as I know. But uh, uh, actually, we talked today with a colleague about uh, gender uh, question in architecture. So there are uh, many uh, 
men architects and uh, there are not so many women architects. So we, we talked about that. And this is a question also, this is a question of uh, culture, you know, of uh, culture of the country. It's a question of society. Uh, which kind of city uh, uh, we want to live in? Yeah, uh, Recycled, uh, green or uh, old uh, industry concepts, uh, old industry concepts, uh, houses. So this is this is a question not for uh, architects. Uh, this is a question for the whole society. We can, of course, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can um, uh, show uh, this kind of architecture, uh, but it will be a very small percentage of uh, what we are really building all together. So if 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 you will take uh, Hussam's building in Shenzhen or my building here in Skolko, this is you know zero point zero 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 one percent of uh, construction sites uh, uh, from the whole planet. It's too uh, small amount. To achieve the idea of uh, sustainable uh, space, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.